Hi, everyone. We're going to get started soon. If you can take your seats here. All right. Nice. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Moore. I am no. <laughs> the uh, incoming uh, president for the Minnesota Public Health Association. I'm so excited to get to be the one here to, to open this um, great conversation um, and event. Um, so I'm just going to go through a little bit of the logistics and some administrative pieces before I turn it over to the, the best part. So first, just a couple of logistics. Um, as a reminder, there are a number of us here in person, but there are also people joining us on Zoom. Um, someone will be uh, monitoring the Zoom chat um, and people online will also be given the opportunity to ask questions during um, the audience participation portions. Um, for those in the room, there are agendas on the tables. And for those who are viewing via Zoom, you can also find the agenda on the website. Our conversation today is really going to be broken into three different parts, um, followed by a light reception from 4.30 to 5.30. So we hope that you can stay um, for that piece as well. See if I, oh, I do have control now. Okay, um, uh, I'm going to read our ancestral land statement. So we ask that you take a moment to honor and acknowledge that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe. Indigenous people have a long standing history and a connection to land since time immemorial and are the original stewards of lands and waters. Many American Indians were forcibly exiled from their lands because of aggressive and persistent settler colonialism and US governmental policies, but they persevered. We make this acknowledgement to honor the Dakota and Anishinaabe people, ancestors and descendants, as well as the land itself. Here are our um, agenda topics for today. Before we get too far into it, we, um, we being me and, and MPHA wanted to take the time to thank our sponsor and our partner in this, the Minnesota Department of Health. I'd also like to thank our program planners, Erica Fishman, uh, Maia Kashwahur, um, Jaime Martinez, Melanie Peterson Hickey, and others who helped plan this event today. Um, as well as the many speakers that we have here to talk with you. A little bit about MPHA before we dive into it. MPHA or the Minnesota Public Health Association is an independent public health organization. It was established in 1907 and MPHA has been dedicated to creating a healthier Minnesota through effective public health practice and engaged citizens. We're the state affiliate of the American Public Health Association MPHA is a volunteer-driven statewide membership organization. Our work centers on professional development, advocacy, networking, and support for public health colleagues. Um, we do a, a bunch of different work within different committees. So please look on our website to find out more and, and join, join MPHA, but also join a committee and become involved. Um, our group, MPHA, is on a journey to become an anti-racist organization. Since the release of the report that we're going to be talking about, we've been focusing on changing the way we do our work, our policies, our systems. And we know that while we've done a lot, there is still much more work to be done. We have a long history of supporting populations of color and American Indians, as well as other communities experiencing disparities. But since the release of the report, we have been more intentional about the work that we've been doing to address inequities and structural racism. Um, in 2015, we formed the Health Equity Committee um, with Jaime Martinez, Melanie Peterson Hickey, and Erica Fishman as our co-chairs and our fearless leaders. That was, this was the first group that I joined um, when I came back to MPHA after school. Um, so it has a special place in my heart. Um, the community was formed to facilitate MPHA's role in advancing health equity by promoting awareness and connection to public health and community-based health equity activities occurring throughout Minnesota. The hope was that, um, the hope was to create a safe space to have many difficult conversations that are important in this work. And in 2015, there really wasn't as many places to actually do that. 
Um, the health equity report formed the basis for creating shared language and understanding among members of the work that was needed to advance health equity. Um, in addition to monthly meetings, there are um, a number of additional things that the health equity committee has done that I want to re just really quickly highlight. Um, one of them was the development of American Indian land acknowledgement statement that you heard me read just a little bit earlier. Um, we also began to take a look at our own system and really committed ourselves to becoming an anti-racist public health association. Um, another thing, thanks to the funding from Blue Cross Blue Shield, we were able to do an assessment of the MPHA leadership and membership on racism and can conduct a public health equity leadership development program um, that a number of people here would love to talk about um, and we hope to continue in some capacity. Um, we've also actively recruited American Indian and people of color to be on our leadership council and developed various resolutions and provided testimony, many of which you can also find on our website. Um, I saw my little two minute warning. I know, and I see Erica looking at me from the side, so I'll just finish this up. Um, I'm so excited to introduce Bajang Mua, who will um, come up and um, do a little brief introduction as well. Um, Vajong is the Director of Racial and Health Equity Advocacy at Blue Cross Blue Shield, Minnesota. Um, Vajong leads uh, advocacy efforts to advance racial and health equity in policies and structural determinants of health at Blue Cross Blue Shield um, and beyond. So Vajong, if you could come up and join us here. Thank you so much. Thank you for the kind introduction, Kirsten. If you haven't had a chance to read her bio, in many ways, Kirsten represents uh, the equity story. She began as an intern at MPHA and now she's the pr incoming president. And so uh, Diane, wherever you are, I expect you to be up here in a, a few years and being the uh, incoming president. Um, I just wanted to welcome everyone today. It, it feels a little bit like a family reunion for me. There are some new faces and some faces I've known for a very long time. And I hope that uh, as we gather here today, we can certainly celebrate and lift up this amazing report, but uh, perhaps more so just to connect with one another and to lift each other up. And uh, th this report can be a catalyst for uh, reflection and ongoing organizing um, around the racial and health equity movement. And so um, this is a small, cozy room. I encourage you to uh, get up, stretch, ask questions, interrupt, uh, sing your praises, complain. Please be, be involved in your, your, your ways of, of, of comfort uh, and, and according to your principles. Um, I wanted to share that in Hmong, my name is Va Zhong, which in, um, well, there's a debate in my family and um, uh, my Tsa and my Ye would, would appreciate this, the two Hmong speakers that I know of in, in, in this room. Um, so if you say Va Zhong, it means a good garden or good land. And if you say Va Zhong, it means good hope. You, uh, might as well, you can confirm or clarify this if you want, but it's a, it's a very tonal language. And I, um, I take my name to heart because I was born um, at the outset of the Hmong diaspora. This is 1975. This is the greatest dispersion of Hmong people uh, outside of Southeast Asia. Uh, this is also a time of great concern and uh, persecution for, for my people. And my experience with structural racism, uh, the first and most visceral experience that I, I can share with you is that um, USAID and the CIA and the American Refugee Resettlement Program had a policy that required two able-bodied working adults. These days you'll, you'll hear it in means tests. And precisely because my grandfather, who was recruited by the CIA, died fighting for this country, disqualified his immediate family from coming here. 
because there are no longer two able-bodied working adults. So how, how could somebody who was recruited to be part of a covert guerrilla army for the United States give the ultimate sacrifice and then disqualify his children and his spouse from coming to this country? And I'm sure you could look at that refugee resettlement policy and say, well, that was not the intention is to make sure people could be self-sufficient. Um, that was just a, you know, unfortunate in, impact of that policy. But we see that pattern over and over and over again. And what I think the Advancing Health Equity Report did so profoundly and powerfully was not, I say that with respect to all the authors, it, not, it wasn't so much the content because Many of us know that structural racism is real and is a root cause of these health inequities. We wake up into it every day. We know it. Uh, but it was in the Minnesota Department of Health's report, which gave advocates cover, a framework, momentum to act upon what we've realized in our bones and in our, in our bloods for a very long time. And so I just wanted to open up uh, with a, a tone of both um, celebration and vigilance with a tone of both praise and ongoing discernment. And I think you'll hear from the panelists, certainly this first one, and then the community response, a, uh, a blend of honoring what was groundbreaking and shattering in this early report and, and what remains unsaid and um, outstanding for us to do. And so with that kind of uh, opening, I want to segue to one of our lead original authors, Melanie, who uh, I think is extremely humble. I'm going to encourage you to read her bio because each panelist that you're going to hear, I'm just going to bypass reading bios. I think you can soak it up in your own time, and I'll try to share what, what I know of, know of them in, in my own way. Uh, and I'll just say that M Melanie to me embodies a uh, strong uh, sense of change agency that wherever she is, she's gonna influence that plan, that project, that policy. Uh, and that um, although she was a lead author for Advancing Health Equity Report, she, she is the racial health equity impact herself. It's not a mechanism, it's not a policy, it's, it's a person. Um, and so I just wanna give tribute to you, Melanie, for, um, really paving the way, creating a platform for other advocates and making sure that health equity was practiced, not just promoted. So I um, give you the floor, Melanie. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and it is so nice to see people here and, and know that there's um, also people online listing and hopefully we'll have a chance to um, participate in this with questions a little bit later on. Um, thank you, Vijan, for the wonderful introduction. Um, I have to make one important correction and that is that I, I am one of the authors of this report. Our lead author is actually Dorothy Bliss who is not able to join us today or she, or she may be online. So thank you, Dorothy, for all of your work and thank you panel members for all of the work that you have done in pulling it together and um, contributing to the writing and the release of this report. Um, I was driving on the way here, um, thinking about lots of different things that are going on with me, including um, selling houses and moving and retirement a little bit down the road and, I, I heard a song and it was just kind of a random song and I started to kind of get a little emotional and um, for people that know me know that is not me. <laughs> um, but this, um, is, this is making me feel a little bit emotional because it is bringing back a lot of uh, memories of the, the people and the work it is that we did and the accomplishments that we did in the years it is that we were um, together. So I'll just introduce myself again, Melanie Peterson Hickey. Um, I'm Ojibwe from the Lac du Flambeau tribe in Northern Wisconsin. I've been with the health department for over 20 years, um, working in various capacities. My current um, position is 
the manager for Sage Cancer Programs at um, MDH. Um, I, I was gonna say, I don't really think I need to introduce <laughs> the panel members here. Um, they have also been around for a really long time and continue to be out there um, fighting the good fight and advocating for um, all of us in the community and the work it is that we do around equity. Um, Dr. Ed Ellinger is the former Minnesota Health Commissioner and past president of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, ASTHO, and the Minnesota Public Health Association. Um, he's also involved in so many equity-related efforts, um, currently um, too long to list, and I see too long to list maybe <laughs> even in the short bios that we provided. Um, so you'll have to stick around and maybe have conversations with, with Ed to learn about his current work. Um, Jean Ayers leads the Health Democracy Healthy People, a coalition of 11 health organizations committed to advancing health and racial equity by strengthening civic and voter participation and ensuring access to the ballot for all eligible voters. Jean is also the former um, assistant commissioner with the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, Jeanette Raymond has over 25 years of experience advancing health equity and um, authentic community engagement through public health practice. Um, Jeanette is currently an assistant section manager in public health practice at MDH. Um, there are a couple of other people that are not here or perhaps they're online. Dorothy Blist, who was the primary writer for this report. Um, uh, Megan Waltz, um, Scott Smith, um, just a number of people across the department, but most importantly, um, people from communities across, across the state. And so that's what's most exciting about this um, effort. And I think that it, it's still going on um, and really kind of serving as a foundation for this work going forward. So thank you for all of your work. Um, I'll not go on anymore. I'm gonna kind of turn it over to you all. We've got just a couple questions here. I'll ask um, one person primarily, and then I'll give the other two an opportunity to add on if you like. Um, but I'm gonna start with Dr. Ellinger and I'm gonna ask about the beginnings of the report um, and what's been referred to, um, I've heard a lot, the advancing health equity movement within the state and even across the country. How did this all get started at the health department here in Minnesota? Good afternoon, everyone. Really nice to be here. Pretty nice to be in the Diane Leffler room. Diane was a friend of mine, um, so I really appreciate it. Nice to be here in Northeast Minneapolis. And, and it wouldn't be a good public health thing if there wasn't a little bit of agitation. And so I want to ask, the, I want to request that MPHA think about other kinds of acknowledgments in addition to land acknowledgments. I live in a place where we've had redlining and we've had, had labor wealth uh, uh, stealing, um, and I think we have, have to acknowledge other things, particularly in North Minneapolis, where we've had racial covenants and, and redlining. <clears throat> so think about expanding that. The other is I'm going to take a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not employed by anybody, so I don't have an official title. So I made up a title of public health metaphysician, which gives me the, the um, permission to take a, a higher level view of what's going on. And I'm going to take that level view, and I'll let the details to the people to my right who can give you the details of this. But let me start with a poem that I use frequently when I talk to medical students and people in public health who come to me saying, you know, how did you get into public health? What is it all about? And it's a poem, and it's relevant to today, which will come, uh, the, the relevance will, will come later when you see the, this poem by William Stafford. It says, the way it is. He says, there is a thread you follow it goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost, regardless of tragedies that happen, that people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding, but you never let go of the thread. And the thread that I was given to me by my parents and, that I, and, and a lot of my early mentors was that thread of social justice. And I held on to that thread of social justice through high school and college and medical school and, and the thread uh, through, through medical and public health. And during that time, I realized that with all the good medical care and public health that we do, did and I continue to do, it was not sufficient. And I realized that there are other people holding on to that social justice thread 
just as tightly, but they came at it from a different hue. They, they, the social justice of economic development, the, the social justice thread of housing, the social justice thread of education. And I realized that nothing in public health is just by yourself. It is a collaborative, and that if you braid, braid those different threads around the whole issue of social justice, you can, have, you can make some progress. And I say that because the Advancing Health Equity Report was not because of any one person. It was because of a variety of threads coming together. The thread of social, economic, and policy injustices that we're, we have seen played out. The thread of data that demonstrate, demonstrated the results of those policies on the disparities that we had. The thread of communities advocating for change and willing to hold public officials accountable for addressing those inequities. The thread of a governor who felt responsible to respond to the people who were pushing him to work, work on the issue of equity. The thread of an agency, the Minnesota Department of Health, that knew that they were not accomplishing as much as they wanted to do or, or that I should be doing, but knew that, that they needed to do things differently. And the thread of the staff in the agency that were looking for something to pull them all together to work collectively to improve the health of a population that they were serving. And then certainly the thread of that, not only that mission-driven staff, but some individuals, at, particularly at this table and others that Melanie mentioned, who had the skills and the passion to advance a social justice vision of public health. It was this coming together of all of these things that led to this. Yes, I came to the health commission, health commissioner with that better social justice, and I used my bully pulpit. I had, I had two roles to play. Use the bully pulpit whenever I could to just say health equity is essential to everything we do. It is, a, uh, it is an existential threat. The inequities are an existential threat to us. It has to be the core of everything. It is not just for one department to do. It is, has to be built into the DNA of the department. Did that over and over again as health commissioner and certainly as ASTO president throughout the country. It, I'm sure it got tiring for people, but it was that triple aim of health equity, you know, change the narrative, health, get health in all policies and, and get people working collectively to change what's going on in their community. So that, that narrative change, that was what I used the bully public for. The other was to build and bring in other partners. And this report, one of the most dramatic things about this report is that every single commissioner in the Dayton administration signed on to this report. People across the country could not believe that we did that. And it did that because we worked with each one of those commissioners to say, you have a role to play in health and your staff has a role to play in health and we need you in partnership. This is not competition. We need everybody collectively and we can help each other su succeed. And so that was my role to bring the issue forward, keep it forward, keep it as the centerpiece of everything that we do, and then work with my staff, particularly the people here to my right, to create this report. So that's the thread. It's the thread of social justice with the medical and public health background braided with the thread of social justice, of education, transportation, corrections, economic development that really led to this report. Thank you, Ed. Jean? Jeanette, would you like to add anything? Um, thank you for that, Ed. I appreciate the, um, is this on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate the idea of a, of a, of a thread. Um, one of the things that you didn't say that I thought you would say is that public health is the constant redefinition of the unacceptable. Um, and I think that for me, the work on this report is really grounded in a, uh, a deep sense of discontent with the way things are. And in community organizing, we call that getting grounded in your self-interest. And so for six or seven years before I came to the department, I was trying to figure out how you build the public and political will to create the changes that we needed to see. And that, um, and so when I think about this, this report, it was actually in, it came out and you know, we had the opportunity to write the, the um, legislative language in 2013, but, but we arrived in 2011 and it was a process that I think maybe Jeanette will have a chance to contribute a, a part of the story to, but of, of how do we create that sense of opportunity and change? And so it, Am I, is this a moment that I get to say a little bit about the how of the report? Is this 
why don't we save it for the next to save question. it for the next question okay yeah. well let's, the let's see if oh i got the mic she can't stop me she can't tell me let's okay, see if has i'll just close to add. i'll just close this yeah. up by saying i think one of the tenets and underpinnings of the report is that it was action oriented it gave people things to do it opened up possibilities of how to work together but also how to work outside the agency and inside the agency. So I think the action component wasn't enough to do a disparities report that just had the data, but so what? So what do we do now? So, and, so and I, actually, Jean, we are on to the next yeah. question, so go for it. Okay, so, so when we think about the, the idea of this moment in time, the way we, we thought about it was how can we use this opportunity to, actually create system change within the agency and the, and, the, and the state more broadly. How can we use the preparation of a report, not a report, but the development of a report as the start of a broader intentional change process? And so I, I really want to focus that our mission when we started out, and you can go back and look at the project charter, it was to ex build and strengthen leaders across the, and champions across the agency and in the community and to help people lead from where they are at every level. And so one of the things that we did was we said, what are all of our tools? We have a whole bunch of different levers. We have data, we have convening, we have reports, we have the bully pulpit, we have the health impact assessments. We have all these tools in the agency. How do we start to uh, align them toward, toward uh, an, an aim of navigating toward health equity? And, so one of the things that we did was we, we completely disrupted the way you would normally write a report. I went around and we, we propositioned people from their self-interest. You care about child health. You care about, about environmental health. You care about this and you care about that. And do you, will, you help with, will you help lead this report? And these might sound familiar. People would say, yeah, I can help you with that report. And I'd go, no, I didn't say that. I said, will you lead this part of the report? And if you lead it, what do you need? Who do you need with you? How do you build a team? And so for the whole first, you know, two months or three months, I walked around with these circles that people said, that's Jean's snowflake. And this is, this is a bunch of circles that represent the different parts of the department that people led from. So that was, that was it was countercultural. It's not, it's not regular, but what we were trying to do is be sure that people could see themselves as leaders in this work. So that was one step. A hundred people from the health department helped lead components of that. The second thing that we did was we led with humility. We had a set of questions that we would ask, well, what are our assumptions about that? What are, our, how, what are the actual outcomes? Where's the disconnect? And we tried to, we tried to, model the fact that we didn't know and that we were imperfect. And we told stories about that all along the way. And, um, and so then I, I, I'm sensitive to somebody holding something up. Okay, so the other thing that happened, so one of the things that people really talked about, there was a lot of you can't do that. And this still happens in the department. I'm sure it happens in our field all the time. You can't say that, you can't do that. Right now I'm leading work on voting. It's the very same language. People are like, you can't talk about voting. That's part of it. You know, so it's the same kinds of you can't. So, so one of the things that you do is you think, how do I change those broader conditions? And so the story, the narrative of what creates health is part of changing those conditions. And we had, and, and the Healthy Minnesota partnership that Jeanette was, was leading um, was in a narrative development process where we were, we were pushing and promoting the ability for people to tell the bigger story about what creates health. And at one point in time, a set of the people in the room asked the convener to have a separate conversation because they weren't comfortable. And I want to tell this story because this is how we ended up leading with race. And um, so they said, we're here. We know you're our best allies. This is as good as it gets. Do you know, you, this isn't good enough. 
we need you to actually lead with race. And they had some very good explanations of the experience that they had. We reflected on that in the broader, broader um, partnership, but this agitation that they led with, with those of us from the department about the, about the need to lead with race happened in the um, like August or September of the year we were writing the report. And it really helped us clarify that we were going to lead with race in this in this report, and that's and 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 then I was being told I couldn't do that. We can't do that. Somebody's going to cut your funding. Ever hear that one? Um, and 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 we said it, when we're done, it won't be our report. The community, it'll be the community's report, and that's how we ended up being able to lead with with race. And we had a convening with a hundred of these people, Thanks. and. Just I just yes, and <laughs> and and they committed to and they committed to a thousand like meeting meeting and yeah. So I would just say that another way that the department led with humility was saying we don't know everything about this issue, and we paired we prepared a set of inquiry questions, and staff and partners led discussions with over a thousand people that fed back into the report and sort of supported. The recommendations, I mean, that's where the recommendations came out of. So um, that was another way we led with humility, I think. And, and so I've heard. Yeah, engaged. and actually, I, Monica I, was part of that agitation. Right. If you recognize, I don't know if you recognize that, Monica. I'm sure you've done lots of agitations, but yeah. <laughs> I've heard engagement, I've heard leading with race. Um, what are some of the other underpinnings, other tenants that we operated on in doing the report and developing Ac the report? Action focus, I think. Action humility. focused, yeah. humility. The other thing I think we did was really lean into the complexity of what creates health. So it's not as simple as telling people to eat more vegetables and get more exercise, but what are those conditions that create health? And I think the report really leaned into that and the subsequent work sort of leaned into that as well. So trying to de make sure that so we didn't think health was too simple. So we have just a couple minutes left here and um, we did have a question there about stories. Did you wanna share one, Jeanette, that, that you had? Yeah, so I'll just share one quick story of the kind of thing that uh, opened up as possibilities after the report was published. Um, Two people in the department created a health equity data analysis process that Jean was very uh, eager, really liked, but it was a theoretical process. And so we actually put it into a practical process. So the process is that, and we made all local public health departments across the state do it and provided a ton of support for them to do it. So the idea was that they would identify a health disparity that was grounded in an inequity. So for instance, um, health outcomes by housing status or uh, diabetes rates by education or um, cigarette use by employment status. So a local public health department would identify a measurable health inequity within their jurisdiction, which was a skill in and of itself. That was like a new mind blowing kind of thing. And then rather than putting their lens on why that happened and what should be done to address it, they actually did let a qualitative process with folks from those populations who were experiencing that inequity and said, what is it about being low education that is leading to high diabetes? What is it about your housing status that's leading to help poor health outcomes? And the results of those then would impact their community health improvement plan or their, what their partners were doing to improve health. And that practice is not required anymore, but local public health departments are still using it to dig into what's, what, is, what is creating the conditions of poor health in their own community. So that was one example. I don't know, and I, I think our time is pretty much up, okay. but I wonder, if everyone want, wants 30 seconds to just wrap it up. Yeah, so sorry. Well, you know, you know, when my wife used to say when, when the teacher is, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And, you know, I started, I think, talking about that thread and everybody come together. This did not happen just because we wanted it to happen. It was because the, the department was ready. The state was ready. 
the professionals were ready. The community was ready for something and they needed just some action to pull them together. And that's what leadership matters. Uh, and it can come from all over the place. And you'll, you'll see that across the community where leaders step forward at whatever level, at lower levels, even in the department, people led from below, people led from above, led from the side. That I think Minnesota is still ready for more change, ready for more action. And I hope that you recognize that, take advantage of that readiness and move forward. Thank you, Jean, 30 seconds. I just, I just wanna point out that one of the things that I am most proud of is that people began to interrupt their work. So as soon as, and even in the process of writing the report, as we used that set of questions, which if you haven't seen them, you should reflect on them. They're really helpful. People said, uh, we had one example where the people who were giving out grants for, for um, people who had been trafficked, sex trafficked, looked at the difference between the applicants and who was experiencing the greatest health disparities. And they, they, they came to us in, in that moment and said, we actually don't have any American Indian applicants. And yet, you know how the grant rules are and all of that, but because we had done all this work, the legal department and everyone let us stop the process, get the tribes on the phone and come up with a carve out and a solution. We interrupted the work. We recognized we weren't right. We recognized we needed to change in as we went. And that level of leadership, I've got dozens of stories of people doing that across the department that I think we should be celebrating. Thanks, Jean. Jeanette? And just, just quickly, as the one person on this panel that's still working at the Department of Health, um, besides you, Melanie, uh, uh, we still have a long way to go. I mean, I, I can see the progress that we've made since 2011. It's, um, it's impressive. And it's, but as new staff come in, they go, why aren't you guys further along? You were talking about structural racism 10 years ago. Why aren't we further along? And it's always a good agitation. Community is, needs to come to us and continue to push us to be better. Because while we've come a long way, or we've come a little way, there's a long ways to go. That's where you get back to the constant redefinition of the unacceptable, yeah. which is public health. There's always room <laughs> for improvement. Circle. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if we have time for questions or not. Do we have time for a couple of questions? Thank you to the panel members. Ray? One of the big differences in what was energizing was the health in all policies where health was no longer just the physical health, but what led up to the health. And that's where I think the other agencies signing on to this report was so important. Uh, any comments about interdisciplinary public health, where you don't have to be an expert in one field, but you can learn public health as you're working somewhere else? So that, that all came about because at the time I was, I did a cable TV show and I invited every commissioner onto my TV show to talk about their role in, in health. And they, I got them on tape talking about it. And so they were all committed to that and they learned a whole lot in the process. I also had them commit that their staff at different levels would work with other staff at the similar level within our department and other departments. So there was not just the commissioners talking with each other, but staff at, at the different levels of the organization. And understanding that that you know pollution control and transportation could actually benefit from our health input into their projects and likewise we could benefit from their input into this and they just saw it work out in practice and so they became real advocates for help we all became advocates for helping each other uh, achieve our goals in the Dayton administration Thank you. Thank you i think it was also interesting during covid some of the best policies to reduce the spread of COVID were housing support, childcare support, unemployment, you know, like things that kept people in place and tied to their community. So somehow that health and all policies message got across. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. Uh, what we've got a time for one more question, maybe. Other last question. I'm coming, Jim. Can you introduce yourself to me, please? 
One of the inequities in health, of course, is the uh, inequity in resources between healthcare and public health. Um, do you feel like uh, your partners on the healthcare side uh, moved at all uh, over over the years? <laughs> that's that's sort of the elephant in the room, and and we know that the the this is this is part of the education. You know, um, you know, it, it it just happens to be the the birthday of William Butler Yeats, and he said the education is not the filling of a bucket, but the lighting of a fire. And so we need to educate people that when we started to put back in 1981, when we started putting more money into medical care at the expense of public health and social services, that's when we started to fall behind other industrialized countries in terms of health. That's when our disparities started to increase. And so, and, and we have not changed that. We continue to put much more money in. And I think there's so much vested interest in this that it takes the broad community, the, the medical care community will not change without outside pressure. And that's why the work that Gene is doing and others on getting people to go out and vote. What are you voting for? You are voting for policies that will actually make a difference. And healthcare policy is one of those things that we have to make as part of the reason why we're gonna vote and the people we vote for. Uh, but there's a long way to go. And, and I would just like to add that there is this, um, there is an aspect to the work that, 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 you know, that we helped um, amplify or whatever. Uh, and the um, healthcare sector co-opting the language. So there's conversations within the healthcare sector or the healthcare delivery sector about screening for the social determinants of health. I went once to a, to a, a hospital system where they showed me how wonderful they were because they had this food shelf in the basement of the, of the uh, healthcare system. And, and they talked about the social determinants of health. But when I would go to meet with the insurers and say, will you promote paid leave? They go, oh, not us. Do you know? So I think it's up to public health to be welcoming the progress that's going on in the healthcare sector, but to continue to invite and agitate around that broader set of policies. One, one quick story, the biggest pushback that we probably got during one of the biggest pushbacks that we got was when we said, asked the hospitals, what are you doing with your community benefit dollars? Are they actually going into the benefit of the community? You saw so many people go to the governor's office saying, get them out of our business. This is our money that we need to do with what we need to do. And that just says the fact that they are, they hold on to their money very tightly, those community benefit dollars, which are basically dollars in lieu of paying taxes that should be for the public good, they're not being used for that. I want to thank the panel members. Really appreciate your being here and for your comments and presentation and people for asking questions. Um, greatly appreciate it. I um, think that they'll be around for the reception at the end. And so there might be another opportunity to ask the question if you have one. Um, this could go on for two or three hours. <laughs> Thank you. All right. There we go. Okay, well, we um, let the other panel come up for the next one. Um, I wanted to introduce some videos um, from our the MPHA annual conference this year. So um, MPH students and Dr. Susie Keith's Spring 2024 Health Communications course at St. Kate's attended the MPHA conference, and they were assigned to create health communication campaigns, reporting what they had learned on health equity and with a social justice lens. One component of their campaigns was social media videos, reels and TikToks, things that I actually don't know anything about, um, on what health equity issues resonated with them um, and what they took away from the sessions that they attended. Um, at uh, MPHA, we thought that these videos were sort of a, a fun way of looking at what the next generation of public health, the public health workforce, think about health equity and social justice. Um, and we sort of see this as an indirect impact of this report 10 years down the line. Um, we'd like to share some of the videos with you. They'll also be put on MPHA's social media uh, in the coming weeks.
Did you know that North Minneapolis, a low-income, primarily BIPOC community, experiences environmental injustice disproportionate to higher-income, primarily white neighborhoods in Minneapolis? Roxanne O'Brien, a co-founder of the Community Members for Environmental Justice, or CMEJ, shared information on her organization in a panel from MPHA to show how they fight for environmental injustice, and that will be shared in the next couple slides. This organization brings the community together through advocacy work, um, whether that be through their garden that they've started, through different protests, showing up in the community and doing different things to fight for this environmental injustice that they experience in their own neighborhood. The environmental justice tours, which are a big part of their advocacy work, um, help to spread the word about different sites in nor North Minneapolis, either educating on the harm they are doing to the North Minneapolis population, or how they are maybe helping to um, reverse some of the effects that people are, are experiencing because of the environmental injustice that is occurring. CMEJ knows that policy work is what is really going to change the environmental injustice happening. One of the proposed policies at the city level that they would like to propose is enacting an environmental justice ordinance requiring cumulative health impacts assessment and land use reviews, which ensure community say on land developments. Doing this will help the city prevent toxins um, from new projects in Minneapolis. Emergencies happen, especially in an industrial corridor like North Minneapolis, where low income and mainly BIPOC communities live. The Emergency Preparedness Program at CMAJ aims to lessen the effects that normally occur during these emergencies. I just wanted to invite folks to stretch, get up, get coffee. We can't be, again, talking about health equity and not practicing it, right? So please, while our panelists come up here, please stretch and um, get some fresh freshness in your legs. So while our panelists are um, getting ready, I just wanted to riff off of the previous session. Uh, there's so many insights to really build off of, and it's clear to me that this report was so much more than a report, right? That, that's just the container in which a lot of cultural change occurred, in which uh, a lot of structural and policy targets were, were named. And it was really much about the creative process with community, within D, uh, MDH, and with community partners that made the report um, uh, impactful and influential uh, and, and really evolutionary. Uh, a, a few things I want to just kind of name from my, from my own personal standpoint um, is the health and all policies framework really was the precursor for uh, what I would call uh, today in my own work, racial and health equity in governance and in policy change itself. Uh, and I'm glad Monica is here because she's, she's helped me uh, with reframing that in, into racial and health equity in organizing and in community relationships. And so um, it was really that, that uh, social and now I would say political in terms of health framework that helped us make sure that we were, our, our partnerships mirrored the determinants of health and that who we are engaging with 
uh, were not just the usual suspects. And to, to your earlier question, Jim, I think it implicates uh, the healthcare industry. And I hold myself accountable for this too. I come from the largest health insurance company in the state. And if you look at the infograph, the famous infographic of the determinants of health, you, you obviously see 10 to 20% of what creates health is just within healthcare, but that the, you also see that 90% of funding goes to the, the medical and the health insurance side, right? So that's another inequity within the whole system. And so nobody is off the hook. We have to hold our friends and our peers and our allies um, uh, accountable with, with affection and with, with accountability too. So we have a power packed panel and I mean power in terms of inner power as well as community power. Um, we had a prep call where um, we were just going to go through a few questions and at the end of it, we're like, let's just scrap all these questions and just give you a few minutes to do your thing. Just give you some space to uh, speak your truth, to represent yourself and your community. Um, and so we kind of landed at, after just debating what questions to go through. We're like, I think we just need to give you uh, open space to share, share your voice. Uh, before jumping into the panel, I do want to acknowledge that Jackie Dion was uh, unable to join us. She's the tribal liaison for the Department of Commerce. Unfortunately, she fell ill today, but we'll try our best to channel Jackie's aura and energy and, and, and wisdom. And so we'll, 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 the onus is on us to, to carry Jackie's uh, voice forward. Um, I'm really excited about this panel. Just, just he, There's always a panel discussion before the actual panel discussion, right? Um, and I, I wish I could just sit there and, and, and listen because there's a lot of great uh, memory and um, anticipation for, for what is still yet to come uh, that this report highlights. So I'm gonna do a really quick, just kind of name and um, of affiliation intro and then I'll let you jump in and invite folks to read their, their intros. So um, I call her Mai Tso Ya. In English, I don't even know what you, Chao. It just doesn't feel right to me, you know, um, as you know, and I, I understand adaptation, but I don't want to uh, assimilate, right? So um, my, my saw Yang or Ya in Hmong uh, is the founder of the Hmong Public Health Association, a long overdue and very powerful organization. I hope you have time to learn about how they advocated for uh, disaggregating data for, for the Hmong community during COVID and, and worked with MDH, agitated MDH, worked with Cal, worked with many, many community members to make sure that we did not perpetuate the model myth minority and that Asian Americans weren't continually um, invisible within the racial and health equity. Babington, I hope it's okay to call you that. That's what it says in the bio that you prefer to be called that. So I, I feel like I haven't earned that quite yet, but <laughs> I'm gonna just uh, go out on a limb there. Um, and Babington is the uh, founder of the Stair Step Foundation. And you may not know this uh, Babington, but way back when I was with the American Cancer Society uh, and working with the SAGE program, um, uh, the Stair Step Foundation was the portal into the African American community in terms of knowledge and community organizing and sharing uh, health information and engaging the community. And so um, I just wanna give tribute to, to your leadership there. Yeah. Um, the, the word that I circled in his bio was catalyst. Mm -hmm. And it's clear to me that it's not about the issue. Uh, it's about community, being community rooted. And Scott, I say this with affection. Um, I haven't run into enough true white allies in this space. Your your hesitation um, <laughs> is actually a, a a great sign of trust for me. So uh, Scott was a little unsure of sharing his personal 
story in connection to, to racial health equity, to changing the narrative. Uh, and it wasn't in a self-conscious, I'm a white guy, like I don't belong here. It was more, like, I think he understood um, how to step up and into this space without displacing other, other voices. And I think Scott was really critical in making sure that we led with race explicitly, but not exclusively. That we um, don't shy away from um, naming structural racism uh, and, and saying very clearly, you can't tackle a problem that you can't name. And so I, I will uh, let the panelists speak their truth and peace and angst. And um, let's begin with you, Maita. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, my name is Mai Zhao Ya Chao Ying, and I'm the, as um, Ba Zhong uh, mentioned, I'm the founder of the Hmong Public Health Association, owner of Jia Management Consulting LLC, and the director of equity for the Minnesota Leadership Council on Aging. I worked in the public health and human services field for the last 15 years. And I'm going to start out with a quote by George Takei, the Asian American actor and activist. We have a responsibility to speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves. So when the Advancing Health Equity Report came out in 2014, it highlighted health disparities across various populations, but it has very limited mentions of Asian Americans. And while the report acknowledges the general struggles of communities of color, specific details or data on Asian Americans are sparse. This omission indicates to Asian Americans, particularly Southeast Asians in the Twin Cities and beyond, that our unique health challenges may not be adequately addressed in Minnesota's health equity initiatives. And we saw the impact of the prevailing narrative um, contribute to the ongoing invisibility of Asian Americans um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. When 110 of the 223 COVID-19 related deaths in a 10 month period were from the Hmong American community and four very specific zip codes. And it gives me a great deal of sorrow to, to talk about this because these deaths were not inevitable. They were preventable. And so Hmong public health professionals convened and organized when no one would listen to us. We created our own report and we championed for our community. And so moving forward, a couple of key points to remember and keep in mind is how are your processes and outcomes, including the narrative that you're telling, contribute? How does it contribute to the erasure and invisibility of Asian Americans in Minnesota? How are you addressing the disparities in funding and resource allocation and please, please increase the funding and resources allocated to organizations who are specifically serving Southeast Asian American groups experiencing health inequities. And last of all, you know, I ask everyone to think about how you increase the representation, the leadership of Southeast Asian public health professionals in decision making and policy. Um, I really appreciate this intimate space and um, the space to be vulnerable. <laughs> um, and so thank you very much. Thank you, myself. I know that uh, it's not easy to, to, to share, especially with a beautiful five month old at home. Um, so thank you for, for being here, choosing to be with us today. Uh, Babington. Thank you very much. Um, the previous panel included three, four heroic ones who were uh, part of building out this discussion and taking the extraordinary step of producing that report that kind of uh, took an unspoken issue on and brought it to the surface to be engaged with. Uh, and so I 
want to extend my deep appreciation and gratitude to all of you as you were in that mix. I think what occurs to me uh, to, to offer into this conversation is when I get where I'm going, where will I be? Um, there's a lot of energy that goes into fighting the fight, but what does victory look like? And um, I think that in some ways we end up, and, and I am a, a child of the civil rights era and movement, and, it, and I reflect on that sometimes, and I think about how we used to sing, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on, hold on. And as things evolved, I think, uh, did we lose sight of what the prize was? Mm -hmm. As we were pushing forward, what were we really trying to achieve? I think that applies to this dialogue as well. What, what are we really trying to get to? And so this, this report, I think, made a, a major step forward because it started to understand that health was about more than Band-Aids and cough syrup. That was important. Uh, and that there were in the society structural things that were difficult to overcome uh, if you were really going to have health. But, but I would suggest to you that the key word here is agency. And so what is agency? Well, sometimes in our society, agency is Minnesota Department of Health or MnDOT or Department of Education. Uh, and it's almost as if agency, which is come as societies develop, you need things, you need organiz organizing mechanisms to help to bring forward the vital needs, education, health, whatever it might be. But as society grows and becomes more complex, the agencies become agencies. They become uh, structures and organizations, and it's almost as if the perpetuation of their existence becomes the theme of the agency because we're locked in these boxes. I would suggest that agency is the key word, but it's not about agency, the organization, but agency, the sense of empowerment. And I would suggest to you that we won't solve racism or structural inequities as long as we are just working in agencies and not working towards agency. It is the community that will have to ultimately solve the issues uh, that we are struggling with. It's the community that has to end up uh, being so committed to health that it starts driving there, but it ought to be the task of the agency to empower the community. Every challenge that occurs, and taking, for example, what happened with COVID. When COVID landed, um, you know, I, I really resonate with your sense of being outside looking in as a, as a segment of the community, because that's how Black folk are often, and in the COVID, so we were then. COVID landed and it was devastating, but you know, there was a lot of money that came with COVID, a lot of resources that came with COVID. And the communities that were negatively impacted were not the first avenue for distribution of resources. We had to fight to get to the table in some minor ways to demonstrate that the answer is really in the community in some ways, you know? And, and how do you activate the community? I'm not gonna go on and on, but let me say this. Um, how do you empower community? We're living in a time when everybody wants to talk about individuals and families. Well, that's great for some individuals and some families, but that's not gonna get us to transformation. Transformation has to be thinking bigger than that. Mm. Um, and I would suggest that with those parts of the community that are always on the outside, we need to find ways to, to recognize what are the organic institutions of the community that can be uh, engaged, empowered, whose capacity can be built so that the, the community is coming at these things, not just as, well, the Joneses are doing better, but how do we transform? So I, I think that's the opportunity of this discussion to get to transformational thinking, not transactional thinking. Yeah. 
Thank you, Babington. I, I think there's a lot to um, reflect on what you said, especially around agency. And even though, ironically, we're talking about an agency report, I think, I think what we really want to get towards is what has been our, our change agency. Right? Yeah. So um, Scott, last but not least, we have um, some time for you. And I would love for us to have uh, time for a uh, group discussion and conversation. Um, if time allows. And I'm mindful that uh, as moderator, managing time doesn't always mean staying on time. Maybe it means taking a little bit more time and, and being deliberate in, in, in um, going over time, right? And so um, I just wanna challenge our, our maybe linear Western ways of thinking about time. And so um, I, I can be guilty of, of, or at least that's my, my, uh, wait, my, my disclaimer if I am late, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Scott. All right, well, thanks Thanks for the introduction. And I feel like a lot of press, I don't know what I said in that, that meeting, but it was, uh, um, so just a little bit about, about myself and I, I'm Scott Smith. I'm still at the health department. I'm public information officer and I represent the Health Equity Bureau and the Health Improvement Bureau. So mostly I'm like media relations guy and working with the media. And so back in 2014, um, and then a little bit about my background. I didn't really have a public health background. I have a journalism background. I was like an English major and a philosophy major. And the way I got into the health department was I wrote for the business journal here. So I wrote about healthcare. And then after that, um, I went to the Minnesota Medical Association, which is all doctors. And so I had this little progression, like, you know, business of healthcare, then healthcare, and then into public health. And so I didn't really know about public health in the sense. So it was this narrative work for me, it, they like came together and to learn about like what public health was about. And I was really grateful with Gene and Ed. So with the report, I got in, I think around January, kind of late and the Melanie was very stressed. You know, there was a lot of pressure. <laughs> that's what I remember. That's one thing I remember from, from the report. And I didn't advocate leading for race, but when they told me that we were gonna lead for race, I was excited because from a media perspective, I knew that that would get a lot of media interest. And uh, I'm not from Minnesota, I'm really from Illinois. And back in 2014, you know, the way I thought about Minnesota as an outsider, it's Garrison Keillor, you know, it's a really liberal state. It's, it, we were always the healthiest state. We were always like in the top five. So that was the main, I think, narrative in Minnesota. And so a big part of the narrative was just changing that, that Minnesota is the healthiest state, but not for everybody. And so I do think in the report impact, like back then, I think that was kind of news for people. And it was sort of news, not for all people, of course, but you know, news for the mainstream Minnesota, the structural racism. And so when you mentioned that, that as an advocate, you were like, wow, the, the, the government saying it's racist, that is kind of a new thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, was, I knew that that would, would help with getting like interest in the report. And I think that did work. We got like a lot of media coverage and it was opened up, I think, too, you know, Obama was president. I think it was a time, like Ed was saying, where people were, were excited and hungry for this change and to get rid of, you know, so, so much of the negative, not get rid of it, but, but do more to overcome our negative history as a country and a state and everything. So I think there was a lot of positive energy that came out of that. And, and then shifting this to the social determinant, getting out of the it's the individual thing. Like, you know, if you're unhealthy, that's because you don't eat right, you don't exercise, whatever. It's probably your own fault. And so then, then for me, there was that, that component, learning about public health, like, no, that's only your small percent of your behaviors. And then I also, maybe this was part of my personal, I would have personally back in 2014 been more like, oh, these disparities are because of economics. And if we could just like get the economics to work they probably go away and not even really want to get into the racial component of it. And so that was part of my personal journey for the whole thing and seeing like, you know, no, it, it definitely the racial component, the racial history is something that you can't discount from the whole thing, so. Thank you, Scott. Um, you know, if, I just wanna pull out a, a couple of themes here. One thing that was very clear to me um, as we try to call out the significance of structural racism and even declare racism as a public health crisis, we have to acknowledge the racism within public health, within healthcare. That was it only after the murder of George Floyd and 
COVID-19 that we formally declare racism a public health crisis? What does that mean about us as a field, right? And so even, even as we try to advance this in community and across systems, we need to interrogate ourselves personally, interpersonally, organizationally, structurally, and making sure that we don't perpetuate the very inequities that we're trying to address externally, whether it's overlooking the American Indian community or Southeast Asian refugees or intersectionality with the LGBTQ community. There are a lot of gaps within our, our movement itself. Now I say that with, with a, a sense of relative balance, because as we're trying to refine our movement, there are well-financed, politi politically savvy opposition advocates with fancy lobbyists who are creating anti-critical race theory playbooks on how to infiltrate school boards, ban books. In Minnesota, and I don't mean to pick only on Beltrami, but to pass an, a county ordinance to ban refugee resettlement, to have English only at Lake Elmo, and on and on. And so while we, while we try to refine and evolve each other, Richard Spencer and the, the organized white supremacy, they're, they're laughing at us and hope we are clumsy as they organize and try to change policies and structures too. So I just wanna make sure that we, we keep each other sharp and, and also we recognize that white supremacy is very well organized politically savvy and they're, they're watching um, how we fight amongst ourselves too. Okay. Um, I wanna open up for questions from, from the audience here. We have a little bit of time. Josh, I hope so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, uh, my name is Natasha. And um, uh, first, I want to say that I'm really um, excited that someone uh, mentioned the fact that Minnesota has been one of the health, one of the healthiest states in the past, because I am uh, one of the people uh, who, uh, who, who, uh, who actually uh, works on those uh, on the, on the American as health rankings, uh, where we rank uh, states, states based on how healthy they are compared to each other. And when we look at, and when we examine uh, racial inequities, it's shocking to see how Minnesota always ranks at like the worst. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's just a very interesting thing to see, like, oh, Minnesota is really healthy year year in and year out, but not for everyone. And it just, it seems like it won't ever change. Um, but the question that I really wanted to ask uh, was uh, aimed at Pavington, if you're okay with me calling you that. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about uh, the, uh, the, uh, how how uh, how a community has to be the one that like uh, picks themselves up, and I just wonder like how where is the line that you have with that and like all of these uh, small community that we have all over they've all been they've all been wronged by the same big structural uh machine that we have here so how do we what's the balance in your eyes between encouraging uh, encouraging communities to have agency but also real realizing that there are really large systems that a community by itself cannot overcome. Well, first of all, what's your name? Natasha. Natasha, you were leading the stretching exercises in the back. I was. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. You know, I think, I think uh, you sort of are at the heart of things 
for the question because I think all of us have to escape the boxes. And by that, I mean, um, you know, we, we, now we pinned racism as this ogre, the giant in the room. I think the name of the giant in the room is not really racism. I think it's privilege. I think when human beings, regrettably, find themselves in a position where they are privileged, they will fight to the end to sustain that. Now here, racism is an appropriate kind of uh, tag for the privilege that this society, but, but, but there's a human thing that we have to all of us ultimately address if we're gonna get to the changes we really want to have. And so uh, whether I'm white, black, Hmong, uh, Native American, whatever, I need to get to some kind of basic understanding about humanity and strive for that place where the human beings in the room can all come to the table and eat. Um, and I think that we, so I think, first of all, there's that we got to, I'm just, I'm reading a book now about a, an African American who escaped here from just after slavery and went to France, Eugene Bullard, uh, escaped as a 12 or 13 year old. And he went to France and he ended up becoming a, a pilot in their air force and a spy and all kinds of, came back to the United States and faced all kinds of discrimination. But the name of his book is All Blood Runs Red. There was a, so in it, a, a thematic thing of, hey, you know, we're all us. What? We're all us? <laughs> you know. So, so we got to fight to, to come to that reality. So Natasha, when you are in a, a position of some leverage, that part of your agenda becomes empowerment that, that is broad, that we get out of that notion of somebody has to be a supplicant. No, not really. How do we break out of the supplicate mode, you know? And, and so anyway, I, I think there's some basic human kind of reality that we need to come to and fight from there to make sure that we're all the segments of the society that are with their nose against the window pane, we need to strive to find, what are the tactics to empower? Mm -hmm. What are the tactics to build capacity? So if I'm in the position to make the, a, a decision that moves that agenda, you know, and I get others to see and join in. Let's let's create the the army that goes for humanity. Thank you. I think the worst time to cut off a conversation is when you're talking about shared liberty and shared struggles, right? Um, Gene, I'm gonna uh, channel you. I heard Gene talk about the the kind of the the beauty and grace of non-closure in these spaces, right? And so I don't know if you recall that, or that's just who you, who you are, but I, I steal that that quote all the time because we can never finish these conversations. And and honestly, that's not even the intention, right? It, it's, it's about an ongoing engagement and, and conversation. So I invite you to corner each of them during reception or in the hallway or to get their contact information so you can you can go in depth with each one of them. Let's give our panelists another round of applause. <clears throat> right, we're gonna transition here and Kirsten, you, I think we have some videos we wanna show again. Perfect, yeah. yeah. Another one of the videos from the St. Kate students.
Hello everyone, my name is Allison. Before I get started, I would like to thank the Minnesota Public Health Association and St. Catherine University for giving us the opportunity to attend MPHA's annual conference. I had the honor of attending the Minnesota Department of Health's presentation called Narrative and Health Equity, Uplifting the Conversation. Let's start by reading some of the stories I obtained from various sources outside of the presentation. The providers tested me for many other STDs and the implication the whole time was that one of them was going to come back positive. It's very likely that you have an STD based on what you're telling us. I didn't tell you anything except the fact that I'm gay and that I was sexually assaulted and that I'm sexually active. I had to drive over four hours to the nearest Indian health service provider for prenatal visits for my children and nearly lost one child due to lack of access to proper medical care. Unfortunately, my story isn't uncommon for most Native Americans. If someone doesn't face me or they don't speak clearly, I'm having to work at paying attention. I don't always hear my name and so I'm kind of tense. Can you guess who these messages are from and intended for? If you guess that the messages are from economically and socially marginalized community members, you are correct. If you guess that the messages are for healthcare professionals, you are also correct. Here are some statistics based on the populations from the three stories. Nearly one out of five people in the LGBTQ community avoid seeking medical care due to fear of discrimination. One in three adults with disabilities do not have a primary health care provider. In 2022, non-elderly, indigenous, and Hispanic populations had the highest uninsured rate at 18 to 19%. Let's look at four things we can do to understand health narratives as a public health professional. We can listen to the personal experiences that can provide insight on how the individuals perceive health and how their experiences have impacted their lives. We can acknowledge the social determinants of health that have contributed to the disparities in equal access to healthcare. We can effectively communicate by involving linguistic diversity consider health literacy levels, and use plain language. Lastly, we can confront dominant health narratives to shift power dynamics and advance autonomy. Other marginalized groups that were not mentioned earlier include women, people of color, people with a lower socioeconomic status, and people living in rural or remote areas. Again, this is to recognize when dominant narratives are in mass media and understand why narratives are important to work better with the community to increase health equity. Thank you for listening and here are the links to the stories and statistics if you're interested in reading more about the lived experiences. Thank you. All right, Zhang, if you wanna go up to, the, um, to moderate our last section and if anybody wants any water or coffee, there's some in the back, stand up, take a break before we dive into this last portion. I'll just join you here. I'm really excited for this conversation with Dr. Tura because um, in true fashion, yesterday we had a prep call and Dr. Turo had about 10 different things going on in another interview. I had a four-year-old uh, waving at me through the crack of, of my home office door with an emergency because her ice cream uh, was melting and she didn't know what to do with the wooden stick. And so we were um, multitasking the, the joys and um, tribulations of, of being um, whole people in this space. Um, 
I again invite you to read Dr. Tura's bio. It's uh, what really stands out to me is Dr. Tura, your your breadth and depth of experience across the public health infrastructure, both from local public health to state public health across different issues, uh, really connecting literally local public health with international health equity issues. And so you have uh, really uh, done work on every determinant of health uh, and at every segment along the continuum. And um, I just wanna say this, I don't know if this is my, my place to say this, uh, but when I enter this space and I look at many of the folks in this room, I, I see my uh, movement ancestors. I see my elders, people who have really sacrificed their, their, their time away from family, their, their careers. I still recall very clearly, um, Commissioner Ellinger, you testifying at the state legislature uh, on the report and naming explicitly structural racism as a root cause of health equity. Um, I, I know that takes certainly fortitude, but it, it also comes with political risk. And I know that risk happens for everyone in, in this space. And so I know that uh, as we enter into new spaces, there can be either organizational ghosts or there can be ancestors who really laid and paved the way for us. And um, your, your position and your work is one of the key recommendations in the report. Basically in, integrating health equity vertically, horizontally across the agency. And I just read a update that MDH created a new bureau on health equity and you're, to my knowledge, the first assistant commissioner fully charged on health equity inside out. And I just wanna recognize the, um, the magnitude of, of that. Uh, so no pressure, Dr. Tura. <laughs> But I just want to acknowledge everything that preceded you and created space for you here today. Um, hearing what you heard today, what, what stands out to you and how does, how does this report fit into your vision of health equity uh, at MDH? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I want to correct a, one thing. I will, I'm not the first assistant commissioner for health equity bureau. It was Commissioner Cunningham mm -hmm. was the first assistant commissioner for brief time. Um, maybe before we get to that, I just want to say a few things really here. I don't know if you can hear me. Maybe I a little bit loud yeah. so you can, you can hear me, I'm sure. Um, I was a consumer of the report before coming to MDH. Um, I was extremely, extremely interested in that report in a space that I was in, uh, in Iowa. That's, I, was, I was working with local public health as a deputy director overseeing programs, several programs over five counties. Um, really one of the things that strike me is the things that you said. The report naming the harm. If you wanna do any equity work, you really need to start from naming the harm. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was my kind of just like light bulb for me, naming the harm, that is not, it, it's not doing the things, the doing of the things comes after that, but naming it is a recognition of the problem. That's where we start. And then I, I, I mean, I, um, Dr. Ellinger, I saw your picture on that report and you were a little bit younger. Um, <laughs> and I read your story from that report. I've been your fan since then. Uh, I really, really respect you for putting that, taking that hit. Uh, it never been equity never been done without any sacrifice mm -hmm. literally someone has to die you can look at after 2020 uh, so many agencies saying dei equity dei someone mm -hmm. has to die had to die on the street for something to happen so you took that um, seriously um, with all risk comes with that you could have just been commissioners staying there doing whatever they want you to do, but you chose to do that. So I, I have really great respect for you. And on all of the team, really, that put at all Jean and um, the current team that are at MDH for really doing that amazing work. You think that is only for Minnesota? Actually, that report has been mm -hmm. a national groundbreaking report that turns several pub, state public and local public health journey around. Mm. So I want, I want to say that. So the, that is one of the things that really strike me out of that report. And 
I used a lot of the recommendations at local public health where I was. So not recommendation was for Minnesota, but it really used across many states. Since I came to this role, uh, every CDC conference or ASTO conference or other public health conference I went to, I never came back without someone asking me about that report. So you can see that the impact of that report is really beyond what you anticipated. So I just wanna, I, I really wanna say, say that. So um, now learning, hearing from an amazing mind that put this together, the community members, the community leaders, I appreciate um, your wisdom sitting in front of you and hearing from you, um, Robinson, and, and many other. Um, really one of the things that really stand out to me is um, the role of the leadership in the next report. What is going to be, a, the fact that every commissioner was part of that mm -hmm. is, a, is a meaningful for the success of the work followed after that. Um, there has a significant impact on that. And then I think um, the next report is not an update report. If you're thinking of we're updating the report, actually we're looking at the progress of the recommendation that report made. So the next report mm -hmm. is really, again, looking into, after hearing from you all, what is the partnership that goes into that? What is the role of leadership, the state level leadership, not only MDH mm -hmm. in that report is one thing that I see. Um, the other the other part is the inclusivity of that report. That's what I'm hearing from the stage today, how inclusive the next report is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll work toward that. And then the other thing that really, this is the question that I asked when I, I asked myself, I asked five questions when I took over the assistant commissioner um, role. And it, is, it is a significant role for me to be in that space. It is also uh, heavy mm -hmm. listening from you all today, the energy you put in, the hope you have going forward for this state. I represent that hope. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's a little bit, there is a little bit of pressure. It made me emotional sitting in front of you because there are something that is coming out of your mouth that was heavy, mm -hmm. really, as a leader in that space. Um, how do we do equity? after COVID-19? How do we do equity? What is the next iteration of equity? What it looks like um, in a time when every term of equity is hijacked by divisive political view? We just today we are struggling to bring back the term equity to public mm -hmm. health because it was hijacked. Um, mm -hmm. So that is one of the things that I'm really looking into the, to the upcoming mm -hmm. report and how how this report is going to guide us to the next level based mm -hmm. on the foundation you all laid out. What is it this new foundation for equity? Um, and not, not new foundation, the next level, the mm -hmm. next stage of this work, I'm hoping that report is going to guide us to that. Mm -hmm. um, just leveraging the composition of this room and this space, this is MPHA, MDH, community, non-governmental public health as well. And what can we do collectively to make sure the report is not just a report in terms of creative, the writing process, the dissemination, the recommendations to make sure that it lands a punch for seven generations and beyond. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think I'll go back to, I, I don't know if it was Scott or um, one of the panelists say about consistency. Mm. Um, Dr. Dr. Ed said one thing, they, it's a movement. Be consistent in that spirit of movement. This report is going to continue that movement mm -hmm. and, and then working together to that movement. Let me just say a few things about the report and where it is right now. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing right now is writing the report and we developed indicators of measurement based on the recommendation given and then using that indicator, we're measuring where we are as an agency in addressing that recommendation given uh, to 10 years ago, right? So we engage uh, the staff across the agency and about 2,000 staff responded to the survey. And we also had internal uh, qualitative focus group kind of conversation. 
So there is a, there is a, a really large number of staff engagement internally. Externally, we send it to seven, 670 something partners to engage in the report so that they can tell us it's not only our report, but also how people are outside in the community. Are they feeling the impact in line, in line with that recommendation? So when it come back, it is going to come back in my view is a community voice, internally, externally, as a community voice, then how we keep that movement going forward is really what, I, what I'm hoping to see. And, and then having the strategy that is needed with Scott and others, how do we continue that, use this as a tool, not just a report that we sit in our, on our shelf, but a tool that is mobilized, going to mobilize more, going to, um, be a, as an advocacy tool for the equity work that we are uh, we are engaged engaged in. So that I think that piece of consistency and being intentional about communicating out what we see, the transparency of what we see, um, even if we are not uh, even if we are not really achieving to the level of that recommendation, be transparent about that, and and, and then really be accountable. For that, that the piece of bringing mm -hmm. that piece of accountability. So, probably the community engagement is a communication of it, mobilizing community and a consist do that consistently going mm -hmm. forward. The equity work is always done when it is done together. Mm -hmm. So, equity, if if we want to do equity effectively, we have to do it together. So, mobilizing um, that and bringing bringing community in and in, in in that movement is an important piece, I think. Mm -hmm. I want to transition to audience questions and, and comments, but uh, before we do that, I, in the spirit of inside outside organizing, you're in the public sector, I'm in the private sector, and there are other different sectors and disciplines and cultural perspectives here. Um, and I, I say this knowing we're on video and this is being taped, but I, I, I would invite MDH as a whole to think about what kind of internal policies, funding, procedural changes that you see need to be reformed or transformed that is uh, better heard and said from the outside uh, so that community can offer you emotional support, strategic support, political cover, um, these things that um, I think need to happen, but may not be easily self-generated, right? And so, um, for you, for MDH to con consider naming and 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 working with community to identify these things. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. I, do you want me to stay employed? Absolutely. Uh, we, we, you, <laughs> Dr. Chair, you are where you are needed. Okay? I, I think I think there are a couple of things. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I think in terms of policy change, system transformation is critical and, and it is an important and it has to be equitable. Mm -hmm. um, system can change, but if system change is not equitable change, you risk uh, replacing another oppressive system with another one, oppressive mm -hmm. system with another mm -hmm. one. So I, I really wanna see that system transformation in at least three different level that community can rally behind helping us. One is a structural, structural system change, which is how do we transform our policies, our procedures, so that people can work with us easily, make it easy for people to work with us, whether it is in a grant making space, whether it is um, in co co compensating communities for the services they provide to the state. Someone was mentioning that, that I think it was Jane saying, you're always told that you can't do this, right? Still, <laughs> we are told that we can't do that. We hear that on a daily basis almost, right? So that, that space is an important, important space. For me, it's really a couple of things that I wanna see. Meaningful community engagement from MDH. What I mean by that is meaningful community engagement to me is aligning ourselves with what is meaningful to the community. Aligning ourselves, our processes, our procedures, our policies, our resource distribution with what is meaningful to the community. It's not what is meaningful to us, based on our status quo, but it is with what is meaningful to the community, right? So in that space, I think community pushing for a meaningful community engagement, being a voice in that space is an important. We've done few things by doing that. For example, 
the data disaggregation standard that created at, at MDH came from community voices, community pushing MDH and legislators. Last year, data disaggregation legislator passed community pushing that. So that is an important piece, community being a voice in that space. Other area that I always struggle with is a equitable grant making. That's in a space because when you have a resource, you have a power, there is a power that comes with your dollar. How do we share that equitably with the community? And then I think in that space, we need to push hard so that resources are equitably distributed following what data says. Um, and then the other area that I want community voices in is an equitable, ensuring that data are inclusive and equitable. Um, if you're not in the data, you're not anywhere. Your voices are not anywhere. You're not visible. Someone was mentioning early on, and if you're not in the data, you're not really visible in any decision-making process, making sure that communities are represented in our data, that voice is important. And we really want to engage, going forward, engage community in that space significantly. How do we collect the whole story of the community? Because the single story, collecting the single story of the community is what we are good at. But at the most, at the best, the single story is stereotyping. What is a collective story of a given community? How do we collect that co uh, collective story of the community, the whole story of the community, and base our decision making on that? Is it important? The other area is really mostly internal. Um, if you, I, I'm a strong believer, if you if you want to see any transformation in the community, transform your yourself. There is no transformation happening in the community if you're not transforming your own self. The narrative we talk about, the mental model we hold about community, about our mm -hmm. Our, our work. So that, those are an important piece. Um, um, Hill Council and other council pushed us strongly around that. Hmm. Are you diverse? Do you look like the community that you serve? Do, are you creating a sense of belonging for community? It's not only bringing people in, but once you bring them in, one of the things that I realized and I talked two years ago when I came was professional segregation, the modern day segregation, you can bring people in diverse your workforce, but you can segregate them in certain compensation space, certain classification. That's a modern day segregation, which is professional segregation, occupational segregation. So how do we transform that space so that community members come and work mm -hmm. with us to transform the system that we want to transform? Mm -hmm. In that space, community voices are critical. Mm -hmm. um, Hill Council, Community Solution Council, other council, our internal um, um, eye health council played a major role in that space mm -hmm. to really transform internally. Um, there are a lot of good things happening at MDH right now to try to transform policies and procedures, but all of them came from external community mm -hmm. pressure. Yeah. So continuing that is an important piece for, for, for us to continue to transform both mm -hmm. internally and externally yeah. in an equitable way. Thank you, Dr. Turner. I, I see you many see the energy. <laughs> I see the energy and I see a lot of opportunities for, for us to um, help you pursue some of those and help MDH pursue some of those priorities. Um, we would like to open up for conversation and questions from the, from the audience. We do have a, a few minutes. Um, so any questions from the audience? Wait, Ray. Ray, we're going to give you the mic. Just uh... Sorry, so the folks that might make sure to hear. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Ray Lewis, MPH member. You mentioned an upcoming report updating this. Any timeline estimates? Yeah. Um, as of yesterday, our timeline, the final report that you're going to see is October. Uh, commissioner is pushing hard for that. We'll have some party and celebration. We call it anniversary, celebrating the anniversary, 10th anniversary of this, this report that we talked about. Um, Dr. Ed, you will be, you will be there, I, I promised last time. Uh, uh, and then many other will be there, but really we're hoping to have that report finalized by October and do some celebration of this 10th anniversary of this report at that point. I, it, this is somewhat of a question, but kind of more of a reflection. Even as we were speaking and as you were speaking, you were describing the elements 
of what it takes to build our collective power. But I would invite us in this revisiting moment to recognize that to advance health equity or to be even navigating that direction, we have to be seriously strategic and intentional about building our collective power. So when you talked about organizing the, the um, grants and the funds and the resources and how the, the demand is, you know, has been created from the community, you've made it possible and you've sustained the possibility to get those voices in that demand to create that accountability. That's, that's an aspect to it. The aspect of the data and the, the use of the data and making sure that people and their stories are, the different communities and their stories are elevated in relationship to the policies that, that make a difference is the organizing of the, of the narrative. And so those are, are two things. And the, and the way that you're using the councils and, and centering them is a, third, is a third aspect. And those three mm -hmm. practices help build power. But I want, I want to be really serious that we have to be strategic. You talked about the people who are against this. And uh, you know, a long time ago, people said you couldn't do this long time ago when I was there mm -hmm. anyway, but you, you couldn't do this, but it, you know, and so they ignored you a lot, but now that you've been successful for so long, it's not, there's not ignoring going on. And so we need the whole community to be behind the health department's efforts and then the, the health department to be accountable to those efforts in order to, to withstand these kinds of pressures. I would just encourage to just use Thank the word you. power more. We need to use the word yeah. power more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Any other questions from the audience or online? I know Erica, you said there might be questions online. Okay. And then maybe for Dr. Tura or for any panelists. I'm not, yeah. Yeah, we actually had one question come in as you were closing the last panel. Um, so anybody from the last panel wants to like raise their hand and answer this, or if either of you want to answer this, um, how might we engage with communities to find the questions um, about what it is that they need? How can we, how can we figure out what it is that they're looking for? Any of the previous panelists want to weigh in on that? I think when we think about community engagement, it's very different on the community level than it is in an institution or an agency like MDH. In the past, I'll give you a couple examples. We've, had, we've tried to partner with state agencies and their idea of community engagement is sending us a proposal to get our input um, before they submit it to the CDC. That's they're very, you know, that's an example. And community engagement is truly thinking about shared decision-making, sharing power, and that makes people with privilege really uncomfortable. Agencies with power and privilege, extremely uncomfortable. So true community engagement is really about power sharing, iterative, um, iterative decision-making, iterative feedback cycles, it's not about a one-time transactional interaction and then lifting it up as a great example of community engagement. I'm a little bit cynical, but I'm a realist <laughs> <laughs> and I'm speaking from experience. And so uh, that, that's my two cents. Other panels? panels? There's a hand up over here. Jeanette, I think. Yeah. So I think one of the narratives that gets in our way of doing good community engagement is that public health folks are the experts. And it really mm. gets in our way of asking, what is the, ex we have expertise, but what is the expertise the community is bringing and how do we tap that? I was in a conversation just a couple of weeks ago uh, where or if we, uh, so I won't even, I won't, I won't throw those people under the bus, but we think about immunizations. <laughs> we think about immunizations and our question is, how can we get people in the door? And we don't say, what about our systems is failing the people that need immunizations? We don't ask that, we don't start from that premise. And if we started from that premise, 
then we would really engage communities to say, how are we failing you and how could we do better before we write the proposal to CDC? Just one more quick response and I wanna save time for um, MPHA to help close us out. Yes, um, sharing power is great. Pushing power is better. Yep. There has to be a way say, in say which- Say that again, Babakin, say that okay. again. Sharing power is great. Pushing power is better. How do you figure out ways to empower the community and recognize that that's who MBH ought to be serving, not the community serving MBH? Yep. Well said, well said. Um, Commissioner Ellinger, can you come up here? I just want to kind of adapt on the fly. I, I just feel like I uh, want to maximize um, you being here today and um, just kind of your, your particular, your metaphysical perspective on, <laughs> on the movement. And maybe you can join Dr. Tara. And I'm just going to, I was going to say close this out, but I think it's more like a bookmark in, in this conversation, right? Um, I think we heard a, a lot today about the, the creative process, the relationships, the solidarity along the way, the discontents, the outrage that remains and um, the, the outstanding to-dos from this report. Um, and I just, just wanted to name a few kind of policy um, and systems change impacts from this report. And this may be profoundly obvious to everyone in this group, but this report was highly cited in the House resolution um, that declared racism as a public health crisis, which then created a House Select Committee on Racial Justice. So it wasn't just a report that had nice fluffy language, it changed the legislative process. This is a report that was a precursor to the Senate Finance Subcommittee on Equity. Okay, this is, uh, it, again, it, it changed the way we do government and the way we assess policies. Health and all policies and HIAs has helped us evolve into advocating for racial equity impact assessments and the racial equity impact note, which many of us here in this room advocated for and continue to advocate for the le legislature. So um, if we trace our, our movement today, a lot of our progress and momentum we can see uh, cited in this report. And again, I hasn't to even call it a report because this report is just a snapshot of the energy, the people, the environment uh, around health equity. So I just wanna acknowledge kind of the, the, the waves that were um, set in motion and that um, still re remain for us to create. Um, Dr. Ellinger, Commissioner Ellinger, um, I just wanted to give you kind of space to kind of both reflect on, on our, our path thus far and, and push us forward. You know, I, I know you, you had some call-ins call for us earlier, but please, I want to give you just the platform. Well, I acknowledge the fact that this report has really made some changes locally, at the, at the local level, and when the state health departments and community agencies at in state level and nationally, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, because I took this report when I was president of ASTO and it became embedded into the DNA of ASTO, which is now impacting every single health state health department across the country. And it actually changed when I became ASTO president, people could not talk about equity. They could not talk about racism. And I just want to get back to something that, that uh, Babington said. You know, he talked about agency in a couple of different terms. But he also talked about privilege. And, and there's two ways of doing that privilege where you're entitled to something, but the other is that you have an opportunity, privilege is an opportunity. And I have to admit that there are many times I was the only white person on a panel talking about equity. I had the privilege to be there mm -hmm. and, and had a, a and I, would, and I hate to say this, but I was listened to in a different way because I was a privileged white male, but I have to take advantage of that opportunity to make the case that this is an issue for everybody. It is not an issue for 
people of color and American Indians and immigrant, it is an issue for everybody because as Paul Wellstone said, we all do better when we all do better and it's not a zero sum game. Uh, so we have to take advantage of the privilege that we've got in power. The other thing that I, I learned is the, the power of community. I do not, you know, as a physician, I don't talk about patient-centered care. I talk about community-centered care because you cannot be healthy as an individual without relationships. Everything is about partnerships. Everything is about relationships. And so, it, and Gene and I have talked about this, that it is public health malpractice if you are not creating, the, if you're not enhancing the, the ability of communities to, to move forward, if you're not creating power in the community, it is public health malpractice. And that should be part of the evaluation of every public health worker on his or her or their performance appraisal. What are you doing to build capacity in the community? Um, and I think that is our, our constant challenge. And we get pushback. I've been in this, this world long enough to in, in public health to see the, the ebbs and flows. And we are now getting, you know, the, the, the work that has been done in the 60s, you know, made a huge difference in terms of disparities and income inequality, but it got pushback. And now we're getting, again, 30 years, 40 years later, we're getting that same kind of pushback. So now is the time for us to come together to, to really work collectively to, to create the conditions. Um, and that's building power in community. And that's why, you know, getting the, the right to vote is one of the major tools of public health practice. It is something that every single agency, whether you're in business or in education or in transportation, get people empowered to express their opinion because it's it, it, it's been demonstrated that the more that people have a voice, yeah. the more they they actually improve their health. So it's a, dependent upon all of us to build partnerships. Everything is in relationship. As my one of my favorite authors, uh, Wendell Berry said, to think about the health of an isolated individual is a contradiction in terms. The smallest unit of health is the community. And our data always focuses on individuals. It does not focus on community. And so we need to have some different measures of community health that we can all work for. Thank you. I'm so glad we adjusted the uh, agenda for you. That's uh, the way we need to adapt. Um, I, I just want to close out by, by kind of lifting up the theme around building cross-cultural and political power. And I think public health has to remind itself that being political isn't being partisan, right? There's a big difference. When I joined this field, it was public health that testified first for smoke-free ordinances. They didn't worry about appearing partisan or they wanted to be neutral. They saw it as their responsibility to inform decision makers. Uh, and that's the same thing on racism as public health crisis, COVID-19 equity, everything. So I think public health needs become political and policy uh, driven. And that, that is done with and within community. Um, Kirsten, you get the last word. To no, I, wanna, kinda... I, want, I, I want. I want. I want to jump in with one last thing. Please, you know, please. yes, <laughs> which yes. I forgot this. You know, you you know that when I was health commissioner, I talked about the Herophilus of Chalcedon quotation: "When health is absent, wisdom cannot reveal itself. Art cannot become manifest. Strength cannot fight, and intelligence cannot be applied." You know that health is important to everything we do. But I now know, as a public health metaphysician, the reciprocal is also true. Health is absent when wisdom cannot reveal itself, when art cannot become manifest, when strength cannot fight, when resources can't be utilized, when intelligence cannot be applied. We need the artists, we need the musicians, we need the academics, we need the dancers, we need the, we need to build a, a soundtrack for the social justice movement mm -hmm. because all of those things are necessary yeah. for health to thrive. We hope to see a soundtrack on health equity in the next report. Okay, that's gonna be a, uh, all right. Okay. Kirsten, thank you so much. Dr. Tura, Commissioner Ellinger, thank you. Yeah. Good job. Good luck. All right. This was great. Thank you again to all of the panelists, to everybody who put this together, um, and everybody who's here. Um, I. I think that this was a, a really great way to celebrate 
what the report was at the time. Um, we've taken a critical reflection of, of what it was, the steps that we've taken since then. Um, and also today we've acknowledged that we do have a, a path forward um, and there's a lot of work to do. Um, and some next steps, right? We talked about that, we started that conversation. Um, I would be remiss as the incoming MPHA president not to put a pitch down, right? Um, so MPHA is working with Healthy People, Healthy Democracy on a voting and health initiative. Please, please, please talk to, there are a number of people here today, Jean, Erica, um, if you have any interest, please reach out to them or MPHA as well. Um, and we hope to see you again uh, at the next event and continue this conversation. Oh, and Jaime is pointing to the food. There is food here, please join us. Um, continue this conversation here um, and when you leave too. Thank you everyone.